We can't move book. Ah, yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> told me I screwed it up, right? Like, right. I totally screwed it up. I've uh, never met a non Swede that got it right. So, <laughs> I'll don't even try. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, <laughs> hi, guys. Hello. Hello. So, yeah, so my name is uh, Rika Röhmer, and I'm from uh, Sweden, but I live in Lampanga. Uh, close, slightly closer from here. Um, so, Wuhan asked me to blow your brains out. That was the... Yes, so I'm gonna, gonna try and see how that works out, see if you like it. So, I have also sort of a, a story with a bit of technical stuff in between. Why I use NoSQL? So, all you guys know what NoSQL means, right? This is it's like 2012 and you're like, bad guys? Yes? No? Maybe? No? Okay. Very fun. So, uh, I've been using NoSQL databases for like 10 years now before it even was called NoSQL. So, this is sort of why I did that way back when. <coughs> and some of the reasons why you may want to try to use this instead of the traditional relational database stuff. So, who am I? Uh, I am a systems thinker, and uh, dear Oracle has awarded me a Java champion title. Thank you for that. So, I, I'm, so I'm a Java developer. Uh, uh, by profession. So I work at a company called Neo Technology and we develop a, the world's most awesome graph database. <laughs> so if you need anything to do with graphs, you know, like social network kind of stuff, uh, this will do the work for you. So in my past I've done a whole ton of open source Java enterprise stuff, <coughs> including being the founder of the Jables application server and some web work, doctor, ex -doctor projects, probably no one of you remembers that. That was like eight years ago. It's called Struts now, if you're in the Java world. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, in 2003, I formed uh, a, a common management uh, platform in Sweden, uh, which is called SiteVision, which you've never heard of, but it runs like half of the websites in Sweden, especially the government stuff. That's Sweden? Sorry? That's a yes, we have. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, it, it, it's kind of cool. I mean, it's a small country. You know, getting half isn't all that hard, but still, it, it's kind of cool. So yeah, so so and 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 and, and I use NoSQL for that stuff. So this is a lot. Today's talk is coming a lot from from that experience. So, why use NoSQL? So, who today here uses NoSQL solutions one way or the other, right? And you, and the rest of you know what, what it is, right? Because it's 2012 and you're web developer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I don't have to, so it's like any database that is not relational, we can sort of put under the umbrella of NoSQL databases, sort of. So, uh, so, uh, once upon a time, uh, people were doing uh, applications and the typical architecture would be something like this. You would have like a database with all your stuff. You would have an application layer thing. Uh, today, I guess Ruby, PHP, whatever, where all your logic and all the code is. And then you would have a client. It could be a fact client, it could be a browser client, JavaScript, you know, whatever. But you sort of have these three things. So the question would be, what do you put in the in the in the database slot? So uh, typically, uh, people would use a relational database system, and many people would use something like MySQL. Other people in the corporate world would use something like uh, the DB2, the Oracle, the Microsoft SQL Server, and that kind of stuff. But it would be something relational, you know, tables, rows, columns, that kind of stuff. So, if you're using, uh, if you're accessing this database and you have a domain model, how many here know what a domain model is? Yes. <laughs> right. So, in Norway, that would be like 99% of people. <laughs> so, wrong crowd. Yeah, in Norway. In Norway, yeah, exactly. So, that's fine. So, but basically the idea is you have your database with your data and then you would have these objects 
in a model which would represent all the data in your database. So you would have to have a way of mapping the data, the raw data, into the objects. So you would have an object relational mapper. And at least in the Java world, uh, there's one called Hibernate, that is one of the most popular ones. Uh, and that would be a fairly okay way to do it. So basically what happens is that you have your domain objects in, in memory, and you would sort of try to map all the, the fields into uh, columns, and the rows would be individual objects kind of thing, on the very simplest of levels. But that's basically what you're trying to achieve. And that's, that's how most people would do uh, applications when you have this kind of structure. So, uh, but, so way back when, when I was creating the, the citation uh, content management system, I was sort of looking at, okay, what do I, if I just look at it as a tool, what do I want a database to do for me? What are the use cases of a database? <coughs> and see if this relational thing sort of fits what I want it to do. So basically, I want the database to do roughly four things for me. The first thing, because I'm using objects, is that I want to take my objects in memory and I want to store them to disk, to the database, and I want to be able to load them later on. Typically, I will get like a web request and I will load an object and I will make some changes and I will store down the changes back to the database. Load store. The second thing I want to be able to do is to make queries. I want to find stuff. Find me all the objects that look something like this or that meet this criteria. Querying this thing. The third thing I want to do is to do reports. So that has nothing to do with the application as such, but I have a lot of data that I want to somehow create a report, a PDF report, HTML report, graphs, you know, the usual kind of things. And the fourth thing I want a database to do for me is opposite stuff. I want to be able to do a backup. I want to do scaling if, if, it's, if it's really popular, you know, like this, this website just now, you know, I want to be able to add more boxes to do that. Uh, if one of the servers fail, I would like to have another one to, uh, to handle that for me. So op stuff. So these are basically the four different things that I want a database to do for me. Then I am happy. So if we take a look through these four different things, so the, the thing is, when it comes to this whole load store, when you are doing object relational uh, things, there's this problem called the object relational impedance matching thing. And it's basically that you have your round objects and you're trying to sort of get them into the square tables and they just don't match. And if you've done this, you know like you want to strangle someone because it just doesn't quite work. And it gets even worse if you have a lot of uh, structures, uh, if you have a lot of like values value objects that just doesn't match well with the relational paradigm. It's a bloody nightmare, uh, quite frankly. So that doesn't, when you're a startup, right, you don't have a lot of time, you don't have a lot of money, and you sort of have to do that kind of stuff. That takes away from all the fun things you want to do, and it takes just too much time. Latency is another thing. So if you're using an object relational mapper, because these objects are so different from your tables, to load one object, you might have to do a lot of requests to the database to sort of get the different parts of the data and put them to back, back together into the object. And then once you've done your changes, you have to sort of put that back into the right place in the database. So you're going to have to have a lot of requests. And if the database is uh, separated network-wise from your application, uh, you're going to have latency problems, basically. Uh, it's going to take a long time. And if you're doing a website, that's no fun, because website visitors are typically quite picky with that. The last thing uh, which the relational database uh, paradigm uh, sort of has an issue with is that you have to have a, a schema. You have to have a definition of like, here's my tables, here's the columns, and this is exactly how everything should work. And since you're all in the web world and it's 2012, you know that the web is super messy. You know, you, it's really hard to do these schemas where you know, everything is supposed to look the same way, because that's not the world that we live in. It, 
it's really hard to do this. And a huge problem comes when you have a really big database and you want to go from version 1 to version 2. And it's like, yeah, we have to take down the website for an hour because we're doing schema migration. You're changing everything from version 1 to version 2. And I usually like to compare this to the internet. You know, it's like, oh, guys, uh, we're going to stop the internet today because we're switching from HTML3 to HTML4, right? Everyone just stop. All the web service, all the browsers, you have to update now. That's the relational thinking, right? And it's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's just no fun if you have a big database and you want to do changes. So what do you do? You don't do changes. <laughs> it's like version one, awesome. Version two, very expensive. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so load store fail. Uh, so next thing, right? So with queries, so you have this SQL language to to make queries, and you can find stuff, and you know that's great sometimes, but it depends on what kind of queries you want to do. So if you have a lot of queries that are, for example, relationship heavy, for example, uh, let's take the room, and we have all relationships to each other. We are objects, for example. We have relationships, uh, work-wise, friend-wise, any-wise, and you want to say, okay, given Wuhan, can we find all the people that he knows through three friends or more that have a decent salary? Because I'd like to meet them. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, right? Doing that as a SQL thing? I have friends who tried doing that, and they had to like use Excel to generate like really long SQL statements, and it doesn't quite work. Once you have a statement, trying to execute that, or they could try to change it, which is the fun part, <laughs> is, is just really bad. And then, of course, text search. You know, uh, doing free text search in, in, in a big database uh, was not very common, perhaps, in the 80s, but this is 2012. We do free text search quite a lot, and relational databases typically are not as good as a you know, uh, search engine uh, doing that. It's just not very good. And then the thing that, that, that I, I had a big problem with uh, when I was uh, doing the content management system is that, uh, never mind, that, that's too technical. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so, brain blowing, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, so never mind. So, you have objects, right? So, if you have a lot of different types of objects, let's say we have people and we have tables, they are different classes when we do object oriented programming. Turns out they have some things that are similar. Let's say weight, right? We can weigh each of you and we can weigh the table. So, there are some things that are the same even though you are different types of objects. Why are we analogizing here? So the thing is, you want to program this way. You want to basically say, here's an object, and he has this kind of stuff. He has some weight thing, and he has a, a, a volume thing, and price or whatever, right? This kind of thing. So, so when you do searches, you might want to say, give me any object whose weight is five or more. <laughs> and if you're doing a relational database where it's like, well, here's the table with the people, here's the one with the tables, and the table with the table. <laughs> <laughs> it is too technical. <laughs> That's what we call a recursive fun. <laughs> so anyway, right? So when you when you have everything is like separate. So then when you try to make a query that says, you know, give me anything that looks like this and has the weight more than five, the database doesn't quite like that. It's Mm. Doesn't want that. He wants like here's the people, here's the tables, and they're like separate. Bad. Doesn't work. It's horrible. <coughs> right. So queries. Mm. Depending on what you do. But you do if you do anything 2012 webby stuff, not so fun. Create reports. So if you do the traditional reports, like you have your charts and you have your tables, you have your averages, and that's all you're doing, you know, that's they're pretty good at that because they were the relational databases were made for that kind of report. However, if you get into like real time reporting, faceted browsing, how <coughs> faster browsing? No, yes, maybe Google it afterwards. <laughs> uh, MapReduce kind of things. It's it's you know 
relation databases are, they don't even know what it is. <laughs> now, let's be clear about it. So, no fun. Anything, have you tried to do a, a relation database but which has trees and taxonomies? <laughs> oh my god. You know, it's, it's not fun at all. And it gets to like PhD kind of like, yeah, you can sort of fake it with this table and then you have like linking. Just don't update it, please. <laughs> I have a this kind of looks like a tree even though it's a table. But it's like, yeah, so it, 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 it fails on this one as well. It was probably okay in the 80s, but, but when you want to try to do something, anything remotely interesting, it does no good, right? So op stuff, let's see, no, op stuff. Failover? Yeah, sure, you, you can do that with a lot of the relation databases, no problem. Scaling? Okay, yeah, you can have many boxes, master slave, you know, replication, no problem. Backup? Yeah. <laughs> but... This can be quite expensive. Uh, one, in terms of licenses, depending on your, your favorite vendor, of course. Uh, and because these, because you're trying to use these databases for something that they really don't like. So that means they're going to use way too much CPU to do what you want them to do, which means that you need to have way too many boxes for the relative simple things that you're asking them to do. So it, it sort of is okay, but it can be quite uh, Please store this ID with this stuff, whatever it is. And then later you can say, give me the stuff that was associated with this ID. So basically, you don't have any mapping problems at all, because the database will just take whatever you give to it, and then give it back later, and you're happy. All the mapping is just gone. No, you just say, I don't know, six months of your startup funding. <laughs> which is very nice. You can do that, or uh, you can also serialize the thing to like JSON or XML documents that are reasonably easy to, to store away, and you can get them back into Office later. That works pretty well. Or you can use a, a, a graph database like the one I'm working on. Uh, and all of these three are pretty good on the load store thing, because it maps to the object model, the way, the way you would uh, doing it, whether you're doing it in Java, .NET, or PHP, or anything really. So the mapping problem is like, gone, fixed. Latency, so the cool thing here, I, I, I really do prefer the key value uh, thing, and I also prefer to use in-process key value source, because when you ask it for uh, an object, like, give me, give me the data for this ID, it's like, done. It's really, really fast when you use it in-process. And because, when I ask it, give me the data for this ID, I can do it in one request. I don't have to go to a database like with a relation database. It's like, yeah, this table over here, this table over here, something over there, and it's like, take them all and put them together. No. It's one call, and it's really fast. So the latency problem is like, not an issue. Schema handling. So most of the, the NoSQL databases don't do schema, meaning you have to do it yourself, meaning there's work for you to be done. So th there's, there's, that's a trade-off. It's really tricky. <laughs> but you can do interesting things with it. For example, when, when we did uh, schema migration in the, condiment, the, the citation on the management system, what we did was that we took all these blobs that we couldn't really do anything with, and we serialized it to XML. We had a really nifty XSLT transformation to the new version and then we put it back into the key value store. It's amazing what you can do with SSLT, but you, know, you just need to limit yourself to certain things, otherwise it gets really bad. You can go online and Google like SSLT horror stories, <laughs> and you'll find quite a bit. Uh, so, so the schema handling is like this good, bad, good, good news and bad news. You have to do it yourself, but because you can do it yourself, or use a framework that, that does this for you, you have a whole lot more options. You don't have to transform the entire database in like one go, which is really nice. You can do it uh, on the fly even. Like you're loading, you have a new version of the application and you're loading an object that was stored with an old version and you can see, oh, this stuff is old. I'm gonna transform it and migrate it on the fly as I load it. That's, I, I did that with my last product and it works really well. 
and it's kind of cool to talk about. <laughs> it bro blows people's brains, <laughs> which I like. So, okay, so uh, querying the domain model, right? So it comes really down to what kind of queries do you want to do, because it really depends. If you want to do text search, fine, you have uh, the Lucene search engine. Uh, you want to do graphy stuff, you can use the mind the, the, the graph, uh, near the graph database, or this uh, whole bunch of RDF uh, databases that are really good at these kind of graph searches. You know, give me anything where the network looks something like this, and these guys will do it for you. Uh, if you're focusing more on the aggregate type queries, there's a whole bunch of options for doing that. So here it really depends on what kind of queries do you need to do. And there are solutions for those particular kinds of queries. And they're all really good for it. It's the right tool for their job, depending on what your job is. Reporting. So here, again, you want to pick the NoSQL store depending on what kind of reporting you want to do. Right? Graphs, again, near for day. And if you have any kind of aggregation map produced, uh, Hadoop, Cassandra, or MongoDB, for example. Uh, there's, there's one RDF database called Sesame. Uh, it has a really cool faceted browsing uh, interface for doing uh, reporting or uh, exploring the data. So basically, uh, what it does uh, is that you have a data set. Let's say you have a data set of ULOT, right? So all of you are in the RDF database somehow. So faceted browsing, basically the way it works, is that it will show you of all these people uh, these many, these are the types of job titles. You know, so you have software developers, web developers, graphics designers, uh, account managers, uh, headhunters, you know, that kind of stuff are in here, right? And that's it. So that might be one thing. And then another thing might, might be where do you live? So you, you know, you're living in different parts of, of, uh, of the city. So faster browsing then allows you to sort of pick one of those dimensions at a time and cut them down. It's like, I want to only the web developers. You click on web developers, okay, then you're minimizing the data set to only show that. And then you get to see how the facets of that data set changes on the fly. And that can be really, really useful as an alternative way of exploring your data set. So, yeah, NoSQL, depending on what kind of reporting needs you have, can handle this much better than an relation database. Op stuff. Failover? Yeah, 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 okay, sure, you can do that. Scaling? Okay. Backup? Yeah. But because this is a better match for the job, it's better use of the boxes, so there's fewer boxes. And a lot of the NoSQL uh, offerings have open source licenses, so you, you basically be cheaper uh, in terms of ops and in terms of running your, uh, your apps. So that's all good. So now we might be, you know, thinking like, but how do I pick? You know, I guess I'm only NoSQL train and I want to like go somewhere, but I don't really know which database to choose. So here comes the Zen moment, the, the brain blowing part. How do I pick? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're all wondering, has he gone mad? You know? How do we but I want to pick and I'm saying no, you don't. So how do you pick without picking, right? I mean, you're all Asians. You should get the same thing. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, so here's the, the, the big word. It's called event sourcing. Have you heard about it before? Anyone? Please? Awesome. <laughs> then I get to tell it to you for the first time. You're virgins. <laughs> so amazing. Yay. Yes. So event sourcing is your savior yes. in NoSQL heaven, right? I'm going to give you a very short intro to how this stuff works. I'm going to gloss over so many technical details, but so go online after this little teaser to see like the, the real techie stuff. So basically, we go back to the first slide, right? How do you make your, your application? You have a client, right? Great. What does the client do? Well, instead of doing the typical, I'm going to send a request to a web application, I'm going to do something slightly different. The things that it sends, I'm going to do as commands. Commands are basically, please, can you do this for me? So for example, if you are on Facebook, a command would be, uh, this guy uh, has a friend request to this guy. That's a command. It's in the imperative. Syntax and knowing English here is very, 
very helpful. You have to understand. You know, I'm, 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 I'm very serious. A lot of people have trouble with this because they don't, they, they can't formulate this uh, imperative, and it gets screwed up. It's actually one of the biggest problems, you know, because the technical is kind of not that much. So what happens is that you have a domain model because you have domain. Oh, right, crap. <laughs> so, yeah. Imagine that you have a domain model, and this is where all your business logic is. And this is the one that gets the command, and basically the domain model wants to take a decision, yes or no. Do I like this command or do I, do I not like this command? If you're on Facebook, it's like, well, dude, you, you guys are already friends, so no. Cannot. You cannot be friends two times. <laughs> two times in friends, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's in the domain model. Right? So you have commands coming in, and the, the domain model says yes or no, basically. So what comes out of the domain model? Out from the main domain model comes events. Events are in the passive form. These are things that have happened. Wuhan have befriended Rika. Right? So that, that's, that's an event that comes out. So this is a little object, a little thing, a little value more like. It comes out of the domain model. And this tells the world this has happened. So what do we do with that thing? We put it into the event store. The event store is, this is a, uh, a list of everything that has been, decide, been decided upon in one way or the other. That's the source of truth for this application. What do we do with that? Well, since we have a source of truth and it's an event store, it's basically a list of things that have happened. Those you can feed into event processors. What do they do? Well, that's basically logic that can turn all of this event goodness into however many different types of stores you want. If you want to put them in Neo or MySQL or Hadoop or Mongo or Cassandra or whatever, all at the same time, one at a time, it's really up to you. And the cool thing is that you can do this at any time. You can start your application by saying, well, you know, we, we just had this. Uh, let's put Neo in and, you know, you're happy. Two years later, it's like, oh shit, we need to have uh, MySQL because we need to get a report out or someone needs to integrate to MySQL. What do we do? Normally, you're screwed. But because you're on the, you're in NoSQL heaven, so you're using <coughs> that means you have an event store. So you go and say, that's no problem. All I have to do, I create a new event processor. I go through all the events that was created from day one mm. in the entire system, and I'm going to feed it into MySQL. Do you get the tables wrong? Are you going to do schema migration? No. You're going to drop database, create a new database, and do the whole thing again. Do three different tables if you want to. However many you want. So this is like, this is no SQL heaven. Where is this event store? Where is it, uh, is it persistent? Or? Yes, this is very much persistent. Where? Uh, wherever you feel like. So what, 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 whatever database that you feel like is a very good place to store this. So this, this could be a relation database. I, you could also put it in text files with one line being, this is an event in like JSON format. That's sort of what I do. But then if you, if you decide that you want to um, uh, redo your, uh, your persistent uh, data, yes. you'll have to go through your whole event store from day, uh, from day one with all your processes. Yes. It's a bit of an expensive thing to do, right? Yeah, if it takes a day, yeah. But it, it's either that, or you say, no, we can't do that because we have lost all the data. We, we, don't, we don't know what happened the two days up, you know, two years up until today. We can't do that. This, if, you, if it takes eight hours to run it, if it takes a day to do it, but after that day, you're like, you know, it's almost like you had MySQL from the beginning. But you're talking about really high traffic uh, 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 websites, right? So Could be. If I'm redoing uh, events from like two years, yeah. it's not going to run in, in eight hours. So it might take one day, or it might take four hours, 14 hours, 14 hours. Uh, yeah. What I'm comparing it to is, um, uh, in MySQL, you can uh, um, have uh, replication be so fast uh, that you have a problem catching up if it ever uh, gets behind, because it can never, it never has the time to catch up. So exactly. So. Uh, where a lot of these ideas come from is the actually uh, what's called high frequency trading. So they have like tons of events. So if you Google 
There's lots of people talking about that for high frequency stuff. This is one of the most common questions. I would suggest that you look at the te technical details there. But yes, it could be an issue in your domain. <coughs> Absolutely. But compared to the other way of doing this, meaning that you, you don't have events and you just have a database, this kind of freedom is really hard to get. So, moving on. Once you had all of these uh, stores with the data in one or several different shapes, you will just come be connecting your reporting tools to them. And then, of course, at the end, you'll be connecting your client to it, uh, depending on what kind of queries your, your, your client wants to do. So this is how I do it. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you talk to business people, this is not an event store. This is an audit tray. <laughs> <laughs> this one, very expensive. <laughs> serious, no, I, I'm very serious. Uh, if you have an audit tray, that's like big stuff. And it's like, eh, it's part of my architecture. I kind of need it. But it's nice to have. The commands you put, is it in the message queue that uh, will be picked up by domain models? Technical detail, if you want to do it like that, fine. There's other ways to do it. But that, that would be one way. So like for all of these all of these like arrows and stuff, there's tons of different ways to do it. If you want to do it the web way, with like atom feeds, or if you want to use a message queue, or you know, there, there's so many ways to do it. But the basic idea is this. Technical details, Google. Check it out. This is, the, but this is the, the, the big idea. So, because this allows you to have a whole lot of freedom for what kind of storage you use, and if you don't pick the right one from day one, which you won't, because your requirements will change, technology will change, you're home free, because you have the event store. You can change your mind anytime. It's fine. To sum it up, why I use NoSQL? You want to pick the best tool for each database use case, and in my view, by, by picking a lot of different types of NoSQL stores, I can get the best type of database for the, 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 the different use cases. I have no mapping worries, I have no latency problems. With event sourcing, I can change my mind at any time. And that's about it. Thank you. I think you failed to read, it's still a full house. <laughs> yeah, I know I won't What is this? <laughs> I'll give it up for Ricard. I mean, thank you. So, uh, thank you.